Thank you everybody for being here today on this uh, year anniversary. Actually, it's uh, right about exactly now that um, that tragedy occurred at Sandy Hook Elementary. And uh, 27 people became angels. On December the 14th, 2012, gunman Adam Lanza entered an elementary school and shot dead 20 children and six teachers. We heard every single bullet. We heard people crying. We heard actually the people's death themselves. With the shooter going back and forth to make sure he gets all the kids, she probably got you know into maybe more than one piece, maybe in multiple pieces. Maybe she was not recognizable. Jesse was brutally shot and murdered while he was in his class. And I'll think, is that, could that possibly be true? pulls up, I walk Jesse out as I usually do. And then I remember turning around and seeing that Jesse had written on my car, I love you, with little hearts etched in the windows and the frost. I was so present that I thought, oh my, that is just, this is a moment. This is one of those moments. You need to capture it. And he had these goofy teeth in that you really can't tell in the picture because it's overexposed. And Jesse loved these goofy teeth. He wore them all the time, not just on Halloween. And then I just took him, you know, hugged him, said, have a great day, I'll see you tomorrow night. And off he went with his dad. On the morning of December the 14th, families across Newtown in Connecticut sent their children to Sandy Hook Elementary School. Started like any other day where um, I had breakfast with the kids, got Daniel on the bus, came back up to the house, and then for whatever reason it occurred to me, I'm like, oh, Daniel forgot his library book. So I kissed the kids and picked up the book and drove to Sandy Hook. I went to work as usual and this uh, instant message popped up. There's been a shooting at a school in Newtown. And I was like, kind of like, hmm. I, I didn't think that it was real. Lauren Russo was a teacher at the school. That morning, her father, Gilles, was at home. My brother called me and said there was a shooting in a school in Newtown. He didn't know which one. And then we turned on the television and we found out the little uh, tip of take, you know, on the bottom of the screen say, you know, shooting in Newtown, uh, somebody got shot in the foot. So then I walked from my car to the front entrance of the building. And then at that moment, I heard the firing of a gun and the, the shots being fired. And it was deafening. It was overwhelming. It was right there. I mean, it was so close, and um, it was like, I, I, it, there was no thinking involved. There was, it was just a, uh, just run, run, as fast as you can, away. And it wasn't until I, I ran and was hiding that I, you know, that, that, that I had that thought that, Oh my God, you know, you know, it's da you know, Daniel's in there. Sandy Hook School, call is indicating she thinks there's someone shooting in the building. On the radio, I was hearing things from the dispatch because my ra there's a radio in my truck, and it was, you know, 
send everybody and the dispatcher sort of saying, what do you mean send everybody? And the police, you know, just saying, send everyone, send, send anyone that's around. I think I woke up to a text message from a friend of mine you know, saying that there was like a school shooting. And then watching the news, even at that moment, I was like, oh, Lauren's fine, you know, don't worry about it. Just, you know, played it off fine. So I, I kept having people call with just little bits of information. I found out that a teacher was shot in the foot before I got to the school, and I thought, well, it's, it's a situation with a boyfriend, you know? A, a jealous boyfriend came, shot the teacher in the foot, which is horrible, but, you know, we'll just go and pick up Jesse. He'll probably need to be consoled. I'm sure it was a scary situation. The phone was ringing at that point, and uh, it was Barb, and she said, um, Rob, I'm here. And I said, I'm going to a scene, you know, that sort of thing. And the best I can remember the conversation was she says, I know I'm at the school. And I, and she says, I'm hiding. And I thought, you're hiding under a desk? And I so um, my words to you were, you know, we'll stay low and I'll be there soon. Um, and you said something to the effect of make sure the twins are okay. To the, to the effect of like, I won't be coming out of this. So you take care of the kids. I have this vivid, vivid memory of thinking to myself, my son is in that building. And, um, and just like wanting to go get him. And I had this other thought of, I have two children at home. And so there was this, this uh, you know, dilemma. I remember this, do I, do, I, do I run inside and get Daniel? Or do I stay alive, you know, for the children I have at home? When I arrived, thinking that my wife was no longer with us, um, you know, I saw her escorted by um, the police across the parking lot. So I was the first person who kind of had that, that relief, knowing that a family member was okay. And then um, saw Daniel. I knew that my family that day was complete. It was just a huge relief to see Daniel coming out of the building. Um, not many people know this. O only I think a few of the moms and dads and kids who were there knew this was that the speaker was on at the time. So could you hear stuff when the speaker was on? Oh yeah, yeah. Like that. Well, um, let's just say it was real harsh. Um, there was, um, we heard every single bullet. We heard, uh, people crying. We heard, actually, the people's death themselves. It was real harsh. I, w I won't get into too many details, um, because, well, let's just, say that most of my feelings I usually keep to myself. And um, now that it's happened, not many people just talk. There's still shooting going on, please. All right, get everybody you can going down there. And I ran to the firehouse knowing from people that had um, been calling me that the parents were supposed to meet at the firehouse, so I knew that. It's Lauren's school. They don't know if Lauren is alive or not. And it's just like big chaos. So I'm, I'm seeing, you know, happy reunions, and I'm just looking for Jesse's head in the sea of people and kids, you know, coming in. And I don't see him, but I'm not particularly panicked. The day progressed, you know, first two, three hours. I was like, oh, you know, she's fine. I'm sure she just has to... Um, you know, go through procedure, talk to people, you know. If she was there, I'm sure she couldn't contact us immediately. 
So I'm, I'm walking around to any official looking person that's standing in the firehouse and I'm saying, have you seen my son, Jesse Lewis? I, I can't find him. After the first wave of kids came out, like you said, maybe about 10 classes, the police shut it down and said, wait a minute, there may be more people out here. We need to protect and make sure the scene is safe. So I started walking up towards the school and this big guy with grenades strapped to his belt and a, probably an AK-47 or something over his shoulder uh, said, I'm sorry, I can't let you through. And I said, well, I'm just looking for my son and he's not at the firehouse. So I'm thinking he's at the school and I'm gonna go get him. And he's like, well, we're not letting anybody in there. We're sweeping the school. He said, the kids are hiding. And I thought, oh, of course, you know, Jesse, protector Jesse, he's uh, hiding somewhere. And, and it's gonna take him hours to find him because he's so resourceful. You know, at that point they were saying, like around three o'clock, three, four o'clock, they're like, you know, it doesn't, it's not looking too good. And I was actually pretty pissed off. And I was like, how could you say that? I don't think my brain was fully functioning in, in, uh, in a cognitive sort of way right then. And uh, there was a doctor that, I guess he was a doctor that walked up to us. He knelt down on one knee and just said, there's no easy way to say this, your son's dead. So, I just turned, thank you, turned from him, and JT and I just huddled. I had, I had to work that evening. I bartended with another bartender that night. But I got to work. You know, I still still was high hopes. I still thought she was going to be okay. I texted her around, you know, a little earlier, saying, you know, text us back, Lauren. You know, mom's freaking out. Around like 8:30, I was able to get out of work. At that moment, I was I was freaking out. <laughs> it kind of hit me out of nowhere. <laughs> and at one o'clock in the morning, uh, there was, I hear a knock on the door downstairs in my studio. And uh, I knew what it was. Our brother met me in the kitchen and he goes, did you hear? I said, what? He said, your Lord passed away. Adam Lanza entered the classroom and started shooting um, and killed Miss Soto, Jesse's beloved teacher. Um, and uh, Jesse was standing a little in front and to the side of her, and uh, his gun ran out of bullets. So there was a delay, a few second delay, where I guess he had his magazines taped together and he had to take it out and change it. And Jesse, during that delay, called to his friends who were standing on the other side of the room uh, to run, and the survivor, the surviving kid said that it was because Jesse called out that they ran. Then the shooter reloaded his gun and shot Jesse, and then started, I guess, killed whoever else was in the room. It's a laptop, not a computer. They're both the same thing. Well. I've never really had something more scary happen to me in my life. It pretty much was a time of fear. And when I say fear, I mean like fear. No one's really accepted it. That's kind of odd, believe me. So can you explain what happened? Uh, um, I think I'm just gonna keep that to myself. That day, to have run, 
from that awesome responsibility of protecting him. You know, it's shameful. Does that bother you? Sometimes. Like, it's a betrayal, you know, a little. I don't think it's a rational thought, and I, I don't think that Daniel would ever see it that way. But there's a little part of me that when I think about 1214 in the context of his experience, there's always part of me that is begging his forgiveness. That he'll, he'll forgive me for being human and running. The majority of those who died today were children, beautiful little kids between the ages of five and ten years old. Among the fallen were also teachers, men and women who devoted their lives to helping our children fulfill their dreams. So our hearts are broken today. Almost a year after the massacre, those who lost loved ones are trying to find ways of moving forward with their lives. I have felt pain every single day, several times a day, sometimes excruciating. I've been curled up in a little ball. I have my moments and I've tried to limit them too. When I'm sitting on the bench in front of his tombstone and I let myself cry. What's that? Um, it's a mask. That's mask. pretty cool. Yeah, I draw it on it. See, see me with the mask? I do, it's cool. A social worker had come to the house and had bent down at my knee and put her hand on my leg and um, really sincerely said, I know how you're feeling because I lost my son. And I said, oh, that's, that's just horrible. And she said, and I'm here to tell you that the pain will never get better you will never feel any better than you're feeling right now. And this was, I think, less than a week, maybe a week after Jesse had died. And I just said, stop right there. You know, that is absolutely not going to be, you know, my, my journey. That's yours, but, but I don't want to place that limitation on mine. My journey is going to be my own. I made a decision right there. Okay, this is going to be what I make it and I'm not gonna make it that. And that was, that was really, it was interesting because sometimes these terrible experiences are your best teachers. And, and she was a great teacher for me because it made me realize that I did have the choice to make this journey my own. And, and I made it right there. All right. These things, can you move them downstairs please? Uh -huh. Downstairs, in the basement. Yeah, it's dirty. These are new socks. When dirt gets on socks, the socks get dirty. We're making great strides, great strides. Nice. Careful, that box is very heavy. Oh my god. Now you tell me this. I I'm pretty strong, I think. But 11 months, and as far as um, getting back, I guess what I'm saying, to a normal life, like, we have to find and navigate a new normal. Remy, stop. You can't eat the chickens. No, I'm sorry. I know. You're like, why not? Dude, are you kidding me? You can't beg either. Whenever we go to the movies, uh, we play the duck machine where the claw goes, you pick up the duck. 
And somehow I get really good at jamming the machine so that they just keep going. They can win unlimited stuff. And you could do that with the duck. Yeah. I don't know, it just kept breaking every time. Really? Yeah. So we won all these there. You put a dollar in and you had to win, but it never ended. You were duck king. That was awesome and Jesse walked away with like twenty ducks. Yeah. You remember that? Every time. Yeah. That was really nice. You know, I almost immediately got rid of his bunk beds because he never used them. And my friend needed them. So I didn't really have an attachment that was hard to do. But um, I found a treasure underneath, which was unwashed pajamas. So that was good. He, liked, he had little plastic soldiers, and he liked to play those with me, like set up forts and put the army guys together and everything. All 10,000 of them. I mean, these are his famous army boots that I had no idea they were so worn out. Look at that. And he still wore them. The boots he's buried in were just like this. This is actually his candy from Halloween 2012. I don't know what to do with it. I can't throw it out. Show me how you make a snow angel. Okay. <laughs> Even in a country used to school shootings, many people believed the Sandy Hook massacre would be a turning point in America's relationship with guns. President Obama put forward two new gun control bills, but 12 months later, neither bill has been passed by Congress. Lauren Russo's two brothers, Matthew and Andrew, have come to the Capitol to attend a service for all victims of gun violence and focus attention on the issue. One year after the Sandy Hook shootings, we Americans still live with an epidemic of gun violence that has claimed an additional, we estimate, 32,000 lives uh, since last December 14th. So as we gather... In D.C., we'll be uh, letting Congress know that we're a little disappointed that nothing can be said for this one year of my sister being dead and her, uh, her classroom of children being dead. Lauren never touched a gun, and she had no experience whatsoever with gun violence before that day. I wish we could say that for all the children in America. 32,000 deaths, I mean, how can you with that on the news. That would be news dedicated to that. Gun deaths, and, and nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants to see the reality in it. If you haven't done anything, you must think what we have is okay. Is there a higher number of people you want to see dead before we do anything? We'll be handing out Christmas cards I don't know if there'll be any lawmakers there. We'll also be talking to the press and showing our presence there. How you doing today? We're all here from the Newtown um, Foundation to join us for um, people affected by gun violence. Uh, tomorrow around 3.45, we're doing a national uh, vigil for all gun violence victims. If you guys would like to join or the congressman. Fantastic, I'll pass right. along. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you for your time today. I, I don't know how my sister would have taken it. If it was my brother, I would have been, I know, much, much worse for her. So, yeah, she would be doing much more, I think, actually. That she's just that type of person. Good afternoon. My name is Gilles Rousseau. My daughter, Lauren, was a 30-year-old teacher at Sandy Hook. We know that the grief we all living is shared by all the families affected. Yeah, for my dad, it's, he's coping with this stuff much differently than 
an eye at least, you know. It took me over a year, you know, 366 days for me to actually talk to anybody really about it. But, you know, my dad is obviously finding some sort of healing in it. So, that's, you know, it's great for him to find some healing. We are here today with the common goal of remembering our loved ones. Acts of kindness and efforts to promote just cause are the best way to keep the memory of the victim of gun violence alive. It could take the majority of my life to try to understand it. I went to therapy for a while after and uh, didn't like to talk about it. I don't got no one that takes it all in and just, you know, sits there depressed or sad, but stay strong mentally at the same time, but trying to battle those two is, can be tough sometimes. Very tough. But she was just really as loving as it gets. You know, every time I came home, it was, it was a big hug. <laughs> she was so short in comparison, I was about 13 inches taller than her too, so it was always such a, a small body hug. I did love those hugs. What do you think of stuff like that? It's stuff to think that you'll, you'll never get it again. Shortly after the tragedy, rumors started to circulate on the internet that the whole event had been staged to justify greater gun control. You guys want a sandwich or some soup? Uh, no thanks. It was within the first three weeks that we got our first phone call at the fire department, you know, saying that, you know, these are actors. And, and the individual, the officer that answered the phone was so, was so taken aback it was almost it was almost a moment where he said no we're not actors and no what are you talking about you know and you know fine whatever and hung up on him and he kind of looked at us and there was a bunch of the officers all sitting around and he says somebody just called and said we faked the whole thing daniel's mother barbara felt compelled to speak out i needed to get the message out that this really happened and in the meantime, I looked at my phone and, and all, you know, these messages had been left by the producer from Katie Couric. And, um, and I asked Rob, he said, yes, let's do it. But Rob and Barbara were unprepared for the public reaction to their appearance on the ABC network's Katie Couric chat show. I started scrolling through the comments. And the best way I can describe how I felt as I read these comments of people who had the luxury of hiding behind their computer screens was I felt like I was being raped. At some point, if you search my name, it says that I'm, I'm an actor, and in other ones, it says that I'm special operations. Mine just says liar um, underneath my picture. I tried to imagine who were these people who would say such things, and oh my God, how lucky they are. You know, how nice it must be, how blissfully ignorant it must be to not experience what everyone around us has experienced. How wonderful for them. You know, how fantastic that they don't have to live what we live every day. Good for them, good for fucking them that they can do that. You know, I don't have that luxury, but good for them. This crazy person called up and said he, he was gonna do the same thing that happened to Sandy Hook Elementary. He was gonna do the same thing to you. At first, it's kind of scary, but it's just life. What, people going into schools with guns? Uh, well, it's gonna happen once in a while. I, I know it's a bad thing, but every place has those times when they get 
shot and stuff. I'm not saying that's a good thing or anything, but just there's always those times where it's just gonna happen. There are at least thousands or millions of schools who have experienced this. It just happens to be that we, that we had more people killed and it was an elementary school. You have these conversations that you don't ever imagine having with your own child. The, the other day, Stevie was having some issues with kind of sleeping and, and just calming down a little bit, I guess. And um, I asked him, I just said, Stevie, is everything okay? You know, you, you doing all right there, bud? And um, he looks up at me and he goes, you know, it's a good thing you're not dead, right, Mom? And I, I said, well, what do you mean, honey? And uh, he said, well, the bad man who came to my school, he goes, it's a good thing he didn't get you. And I said, you're right, honey. It's a good thing he didn't get me. But he's dead now, and he can't hurt anybody else. And he said, well, I'm in first grade at Sandy Hook School now. Is it my turn to die? I said, no, baby. It's not your turn to die. You know, nobody is coming again to do what that man did. You're safe and you're safe at school and you're safe at home and you'll be okay. Um, and the sad thing is, I, you know, there's no guarantee, you know. <laughs> Thank you everybody for being here today on this uh, year anniversary. Actually, it's uh, right about exactly now that um, that tragedy occurred at Sandy Hook Elementary. And I just want to say what heroes both of my boys are. Jesse heroically trying to save nine kids from that classroom and JT taking his personal tragedy and turning it into something tangible that has actually changed people's lives and will continue to do that. I'm so proud of both of them. They're both my heroes and I can only hope to fulfill my purpose on earth as bravely as, as they have fulfilled theirs. I really do feel like Jesse's behind me in this and, and pushing me along the way. It was pretty early on I saw that message on the chalkboard, phonetically spelled um, and, and, and in six-year-old handwriting, nurturing, healing, and love. And I knew that he had written it shortly before he died. I started a journal, so we worked from the journal and the book came about, and it seems that it is being received as it was intended, trying to cultivate healing in a nation and, and get Jesse's message out, which I do believe to be profound. How does it feel like to hold this book in your hands? I really set out to make this personal tragedy, a tragedy of many people, into something that is going to help the world be a better and safer place. I believe that uh, December 14th was the greatest day of compassion the world has ever known. And the two choices that we all make are living our lives in faith or living our lives in fear. Right? You may not consciously... As well as writing a book, Scarlett has also set up a foundation in her son's memory. She is being powered by such a strong message 
that there's no way that you can run out of energy on something like that. She's also been invited to the White House to talk about social and emotional learning in schools and to seek better funding for the kind of mental health projects that she feels might have helped the gunman, Adam Lanza. Hi, Kay. Hi. I have JT here with me too. We want to talk to you about Newtown Helps Rwanda. Since his brother's death, JT has found a new focus as well. I'm raising money so that I can send Rwandan genocide victims to college for four years. I'm selling bracelets and um, getting donations. I didn't like talking about what happened. I can't just sit in a room and tell someone who has no credentials to me. So I just, I, I didn't feel like I could talk to anyone about it. I Skyped with the Rwandans. They reached out to me because he heard what happened in my hometown and um, they wanted to help me get through it. They told me what it was like for them to go through the genocide that they went through. I didn't want to Skype for them. I just figured it would be another one of these like, therapists or be another person who just wants to talk and help. But um, it turned out to be very good. Together, Scarlett and JT are also taking Jesse's message into prisons in the hope that they might reach some of the most potentially violent men in society. A lot of people had jumped on the anti-gun, which is great, but in my mind, that's a symptom of a fearful society, right? And um, I thought what, what really started this, this tragedy was an angry thought at some point in Adam Lanza's head that escalated. This angry thought um, in this little boy's head that he didn't have the tools or the nurturing environment to handle, right? So anger feels bad. And so at some point he did what a lot of us do, and I still sometimes do, we blame someone, right? Because I'm sure everybody in here has somebody who, you know, hurt you terribly. It's just a choice to forgive them. It's just a choice. Then it's a process. The way I was brought up in the streets is like, let's say you were to hurt one of my friends or somebody that I love, my first thought is going to get you, hurting you right back. I, my, my question to you is like, how do you do it? How do you tell yourself like, you know, you know what, it's okay. If I wanted to hurt someone because they hurt me, then when does it stop? Then you hurt someone and they hurt someone and you're in this negative, revolving thing that doesn't end. I've been living in fear because of the life I chose. But if you, can, if you was able to cope with losing a son, I can do it. I have the same murderous thoughts sometimes. I'm not above that. But I, I have the same choice and the same willpower and determination that you guys have. You guys have it within you. You just have to access it and maybe even know that it's there and that you have that choice. A lot of people have that fear of interacting with individuals who have lived this type of lifestyle, uh, been exposed to guns and violence. And, and um, I mean, for you to come in, that's life changing right there. I mean, that's just, that's awesome. I don't judge you. I don't judge you guys for having guns because you live in a fearful world. You know what I mean? And you feel like you need those for protection. I don't judge you for that. I just want you to choose love instead of revenge. It amazed me in the discussion we had how many people, just because of your story and your message, were rethinking the behaviors they've done. And not just rethinking the behaviors they've done, but literally coming up and saying, maybe I'm not gonna behave this way going forward. And, and I thought that was one of the most powerful things because some of us in here have legitimate street creden credentials. And these are people who, you, you've maybe saved lives, literally multiple lives, and I think, 
just your message and you coming here, before you got here, you had done that. Now with you being here, we're all rethinking something in our lives, and I want to thank you for that as well. You guys are my Choose Love Movement ambassadors, if you want to be. Seriously, you know? I mean, that's what I want. That's my goal. I think that guns are a symptom of a greater problem that we have. Um, I think if we took away every gun out there, we could not take away the fear associated with wanting a gun. And so I believe that we need to deal with the fearfulness that's in our society. And, and in, in, when we do that, we create a new society that doesn't need guns. When you are out there on your own, the surest way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. You know it. My goal is to prevent gun violence. Our children deserve a safer world. Stay out of our homes and stay the hell out of our gun cabinets because this freedom is not for sale. National Rifle Association lobbyists helped to defeat both of President Obama's gun control bills. They resisted new background checks on gun owners and limiting the number of bullets in gun magazines. Gilles Russo has come to the NRA convention to find out why. You own a gun for your protection or do you go hunting? I, I own several guns. Several guns. Several you, guns. For protection mainly? For, for my protection. I'm not a hunter. My husband hunts, I do not. For your protection. And how do you think you're going to protect yourself if there was a break-in in the house? If, if I, I would do everything in my power, Gilles, to stop the threat. Yes, and how would you do that? If, if I needed to stop the threat with a firearm, I am more than willing to do that. And how... Many Americans strongly, strongly believe that our Constitution affords all Americans the right to bear arms. And there is a very strong belief that ha the citizenry having arms is in fact one of the checks and balances of a government getting out of balance. <laughs> These I would call chick guns. And very, very clearly for chick women, guns. chick guns, okay? I mean, I was not an anti-gun advocate. I'm, there, I'm still not an anti-gun advocate. Passing these, these little teeny lower law, how to control who owns guns, I don't think it's asking for very much. Uh, but I'm been told by, uh, pro-gun people, and that's you, you give an inch and they are, the next thing they will come and take your guns away. Uh, so that's why they would do not want to give anything away right now. Coming to the gun show was one of the things that I wanted to experience. My wife said, you sure you want to go there? I said, yeah. I don't want to feel the unknown. Now that I know all this gun stuff, and I speak to people like you, which, you know, it makes it much easier to understand the gun culture. When the horrible incident in Connecticut happened, it's a very human reaction to want to want to legislate something to prevent it from ever happening again. I think the size of the magazine is, is just an easy way to find something that you can take exception to, but in a real world situation where your adrenaline's flowing, you're fighting to save your life. If I only have five shots and I haven't been able to make them work and that individual is coming at me, he's already there and I'm in trouble. If I am able to have more that I can use to save myself, I am far better off to have more. Because you shoot till you stop the threat. You don't necessarily shoot to kill you shoot to stop the threat. And if I can't do it well with the first few, God bless America, give me the backup five, because I may need it. I may need it.
Adam Lenzer was a little skinny little guy. He was a little man. And he carried that in with another one plus a pistol. And like they said, it's not. The diameter of the bullet is the same as a 22. Yeah. Lawrence Carr, in the parking lot, maybe three, four hundred feet away, had three bullets going through a car. Oh, they'll, it well, will go can for a long time. Yeah. For, for most people, the respect that they give it is no different than the respect they give to driving a car. Both a car and a gun kill people. Yeah. When someone gets in a car accident, it's not normal to blame the car. When someone was drinking and driving, we don't blame the car or the alcohol. Um, we look at what's happening with the person. And I think um, firearms are a tool. They're a tool for our freedom. They're a tool for our personal protection, a tool for hunting, sport, heritage. And it's awkward to me to blame the tool uh, for what happened when there was someone holding that tool and misusing that tool. Yeah, it's just very, it's just like a car. Uh, you can customize it to the nth degree, and it, you know, for speed, for accuracy, for... Um, Every day when I go to work, I work with the poorest of the poor in our community, those referred by child welfare and probation. Most of them come with the baggage and the mental health issues that is profound, and most often the help is, is inadequate. The resources that I have are so ridiculously limited with what these people need. And when I'm trying to bring them to like a hospital for more care or a facility to help them detox from drugs, they're, they're turned away. Or as soon as their insurance run out, runs out, whether it's government insurance or otherwise, suddenly they're healed. Even if 12 hours before they were suicidal, well, the insurance won't keep paying, so now they get to go home even if they just threatened to kill me and three other people, oh, you get to go. These mass killings really began to occur within the last couple of decades. So the guns have been there. What's changed is something in our society. Yeah, uh, this one's probably about seven pounds, 7.3. Yeah, this one they for with an attack. Have you had to change what you're allowed to play in the house? Oh, yes, very much. Nerf guns that we were going to get for Christmas um, had to be X'd off lists. Um, slingshots, I guess, the slingshot that I was going to get from the Easter Bunny. I couldn't handle the idea that one of my sons would enjoy shooting a weapon after, you know, what I'd seen and heard and experienced and, the, you know, and I just, I, I couldn't have it in my house. Okay, I'll help you, Brian. Okay, then I'll control your eye. No, 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 don't! No, I said don't control it! It was on the wooden pickaxe! I accidentally put it. Okay, wow. I loathe the easy access to guns in our society. I loathe the violence. I have to remember that I'm raising boys who will, in the blink of an eye, become men in our society. And regardless of what happens with gun legislation, and regardless of whether that access is tightened or loosened, they are going to be participating in a society that accepts guns as, as part of its culture. And was I helping them or hurting them by shielding them so strongly from any vestige of gunness that they clearly were interested in, particularly Stevie? This past year, they had two full-time police officers at the entrance of the school itself. What saddens me is that for my twins especially, they won't really ever remember anything different. You know, this is, this is how, for them, this is how school 
should be a police checkpoint, armed policemen at the, at the door, clicking doors, identifying yourself every single time, badges. Um, it's, you know, something is lost in that process. And I don't think we'll know what's been lost until much, much later. I was still a part of it. So it touches me, but not as hard as I think the people who are related to the people who died. So this doesn't mean that nothing has happened to me. I'm completely fine. It doesn't mean that. All it means is just that we're still the people who we were. We've just sort of had now an experience that um, that um, makes us change in a sort of. I just think that um, Sandy Hook is a great town and it'll always be a great town. It's just a bit different because of what happened. Yeah. All these features are here and then we start putting it all together. This weekend is all about Jesse's playground where the Sandy Ground Project decided to dedicate a playground for each of the lives lost at Sandy Hook Elementary. Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to the Sandy Ground Project where angels play and the 20th playground in our beautiful quest to honor all the beautiful children and teachers from Sandy Hook and rebuild our coastline. This is something that I have learned throughout my year and a quarter since Jesse's death, and this rings true in every single way for me. It's a quote by Don Huxbrum, Sandy Hook Elementary principal, another hero of that day. And she says, be nice to each other. It's really all that matters. And I want everyone to hold that in their heart because it's true. I'm still sad, but like working through it. The key for me is moving on so that you can be happy, but never forgetting. I came home from my grandmother's and uh, on the edge of the bed, I saw a piece of graphic paper from a little notepad and uh, it was folded up. So I grabbed it and opened it, not really thinking much of it. And uh, it said, uh, have a lot of fun. Finding the message, have a lot of fun in my room after Jesse died is the most important thing to me because he, uh, he is the hero in the situation and if he thinks that that's what to do, then it's what to do. Oh, you can see the little tunnels? Yeah, you can see all the little tunnels. Oh, yeah, wow. Hey, Bite, did you get bitten yet? No, luckily. Luckily not. <laughs> <laughs> I got bitten through two different places. A lot of people think that you're just sad for two straight years and there's never a moment of normalcy, you know? It's just terrible for years. Mm. You know, there's always good moments where I'm in the middle of doing something and I think of Lauren and it makes me smile as opposed to making me sad at that moment. The only thing that makes me upset is like when we have kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, just so they won't be able to ever see her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I'll miss I'll miss her more than yeah. You have your when, own kids. When, yeah, when they don't have an aunt. When they should have. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am discouraged. The legislation hasn't been passed yet, but I'm not. I don't think it's not going to happen. As Obama has told me and my parents, it takes time for the politics to catch up to the people. It's an issue that people care about now, and they care about more than they did two years ago. So that's a big change. What kind of information can you say that the content is given? No, I haven't seen this before. Although none of the federal laws Lauren's family have been campaigning for have passed, at state level there has been change, with 21 states strengthening gun laws since the massacre. Adults, nesting, hatching, duckling. Ironically, I'm always putting up soldiers here in little rows like Jesse had them. And now instead of him doing it, I'm doing it. By joining others campaigning to address the root causes of violence, Scarlett has also seen change. The government has put an extra $100 million into mental health treatment, particularly for young people. You always hear people talking about, well, if you can get closure, then you can move on. Is that something? Is closure something you can have? That's a great question. I'm not sure. Maybe the answer is on an individual basis. I guess I'm trying to think of my own situation. So the shooter's dead, his mother's dead, his father has left his work and is going to spend the rest of his life determining if the diagnosis is right. I think that's what I heard. Uh, you know, I've started a foundation, JT has started a fundraising effort. We're moving forward in a positive way. Um, I guess that's as good of closure as you can get, but you never have closure. in the death of your loved one because you will always miss them and that loss is always with you. And so in that, in that case, there is no closure on grief. So you, you move forward the best way that you know how. Um, you try to take your event, you try to find meaning in your suffering you uh, try to be a good example for people and you try to change the world and make it a better place. And, and I guess that's as good as it gets. percent more 40-something women having babies than 10 years ago. <laughs> Suddenly 40 came along and I thought, hmm, <laughs> I haven't had any children yet, but it hadn't gone out of my mind. Even though you're older, you don't, you feel exactly the same age inside. You may not look it. <laughs> but is a late arrival always welcome? I was just dumbfounded. You know, the idea that I should go have a pregnancy test at 46. Can women in their 40s who want a baby rely on medical science for help? You can have a 50, 60, 70, 80-year-old pregnant. The question is, is it right and is it wise? 